John, thank you very much, and good morning, everyone. I would especially like to thank the two previous speakers, because effectively they've done most of our work for us. So if I don't get through all the slides, I won't worry. Uh, six minutes goes unbelievably quickly, so I better start. So we are the pro side. This is what I'm going to try and do, if I can get through all the slides. Everybody, not everybody, but there's been a lot of talk about One Health this morning, but it hasn't been defined, so we will define it. Then we'll go over how it relates to antimicrobial resistance in humans, and uh, my colleague will show you that if you do not believe this as a concept and do not start to introduce strategies that are multifactorial, we'll have no possibility of controlling antimicrobial resistance. So this slide goes through quickly uh, the One Health concept applied to antimicrobial resistance, and I will not read every one of the ones that are on this slide because subsequent slides will, uh, will in fact amplify these points. But I do want to bring your attention to the third bullet point, which is contamination of the environment with fecal spread from a variety of sources, uh, including the animals, uh, containing antimicrobial resistance results in an ongoing cycle. And there are lots of things you may not even consider that uh, relate to this. Did you ever think that birds, that their migra migration patterns, are great spreaders of antimicrobial resistance? And when it comes to the rebuttal, I have a wonderful slide for you golfers, uh, which will show what your role is in spreading the resistance. This is a slide from CDC and uh, a a version of this slide was show, shown previously. It's a busy slide, one that I could spend my entire time on, but what it does is show you how three things are interrelated. Uh, animals, man, and the environment. And you can go through each one of these individually. It also shows that unless our interventions get at all these sources, uh, we will not control the problem. So focusing on antimicrobial utilization in humans is not going to do the job. Now, why uh, did this start? Uh, why do we have such a problem with uh, antimicrobials in animals? Well, in 1950, two investigators, Stockstart and Jukes, noted that if they fed uh, animals with sub-therapeutic doses of penicillin, tetracycline, the animals would gain weight. This, if you're in the, this industry, the more your animals weigh, the more you get paid. But then the people that house these animals began to put them closer and closer together. When they did that, uh, of course, disease spreads amongst the animals and they would die. But now you start to give them antibiotics all the time and you try and prevent the disease. So that's the reason for the use of antimicrobials in animals. And in Canada, uh, of all the medically important antimicrobials, 82% are intended for production animals, 18% of humans, less than 1% for comp companion animals, and 1% for crops. My next bullet point was also illustrated on a previous a slide by another speaker with somewhat different numbers, but uh, adjusting for underlying populations and weight, there were roughly 1.7 times more antimicrobials distributed for use in humans, for use in animals than in humans. So uh, easy to remember, it's two times more to use in uh, animals than in man. 73% of this included antimicrobial uh, classes that we use every day in human medicine. A growing uh, contribution to this cause, or, uh, if you will, is aquaculture, and for those that aquaculture is not just confined anymore to places with an ocean. Uh, if you have a pond or any even pool of your own water, you can uh, start to grow fish. So antimicrobial use is even more widespread in aquaculture than it is in the agricultural business. So sulfonamides, penicillin, quinolones, tetracyclines, and phenicols are widely used. And quinolones, tetracyclines, and phenicols are especially widely used in salmon farming. And in some countries, especially China, effluent from pig farms has contaminated the water of aquaculture farms. So you can go back to the slide from CDC, which shows you how that cycle continues. My only slide on how humans uh, can 
contribute to this is to point out the concept that there are some of us who are super spreaders, the same way as, as animals are. So 20% of human hosts are responsible for 80% of, of infections, so we're transmitting it. The same thing that happens in, in cattle, and it's been eloquently demonstrated in most models uh, as to how this, how this occurs. And one of the reasons is they ha the super spreader doesn't really get sick. It has a unique tolerance to enable sustained pathogen transmission. I would now like to, to turn over the podium to my colleague who will demonstrate to you that interventions using one, a One Health concept do in fact work. Thank you, Tom. Um, I'll present some uh, data from a study that we did uh, and that uh, uh, Mark Sprenger actually uh, referred to. Uh, we got it at the University of Calgary from the WHO because we are co-located and work very closely together. Um, and I think that working together is actually logical. Uh, as a veterinarian, you know, I'm looking at the only species that I'm not licensed for. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so... <laughs> Well, it is logical <laughs> to work together, and, and working with the people in medicine, I found out that some MDs are actually good and nice people. Yeah? <laughs> so, so, it, so it is actually fun to work with them uh, as well. <laughs> so this study, and uh, I highlighted uh, the people that, of course, like with all of us, do all the work, the graduate students and uh, the postdocs, um, is a study where we first looked at if we, we know that if you uh, give antibiotics to animals or to people that will get antimicrobial use. Uh, and we also know that there is this uh, one health relationship. But then if you then take the next step, if you restrict the use of antibiotics, will you also get a decrease in the antimicrobial resistance in food animals and not only food animals, but then also in humans, if you restrict it in animals. So we did a meta-analysis uh, on this. Um, the studies that we included are here, and I put this picture there because there are no uh, studies on China or India that we could include in this. Two of the major users of antibiotics uh, in the world and also two countries where animals and humans live very closely together. So if there is a transmission of bacteria with, that are resistant to antibiotics, then those are the two countries where it easily will occur and because of the global travel uh, will come to us. So this is an example of uh, one of the funnel plots, one of the uh, results uh, that we got, and this is on, uh, if, on the animal side, and you see that 22% less antimicrobial resistance occurs eh, after, if you put, pull all the studies together, if you restrict the use of antibiotics in animals. So it has an effect on the animal side. So 22% reduction in resistance. So we pulled a lot of studies, uh, put them in different groups. Um, so in that example, by the way, was enterococci and uh, glycopeptides. Uh, so we did it for all kinds of different, uh, different groups. But in general, if you look at all those meta-analyses, 10 to 20% lower in the intervention groups. And we also looked at the genetic part of it, because phenotypic AMR is one side, the other one is also what happens with the genes. And also on that side we saw quite a reduction. So then if you look at the human studies, and those were fewer, of course, if you look at restriction eh, of use in, in animals, and that could be organic, or in the Netherlands where you do it in a whole country, uh, so there are different uh, interventions, but there were 21 studies where they also looked at the humans and what happens with the bacteria and the humans. So this is uh, the final plot of uh, the humans, and you see that there is a difference between farm workers and not farm workers. So if you see the top group, those are the farm workers, there's a 29% reduction. And that makes sense. These people work closely with the animals. 
So there is a transmission between the animals and the people. And that would even be larger in China and in India. And the not farm workers, it was 9%, so, so less. So a consistent reduction in the animal studies, generally in the 10 to 20 percent uh, range. Uh, findings held across bacterial group sample types, drug classes, intervention types, and we also looked at the study quality. In the human studies, smaller number, indirect mechanism of course, effect way stronger in farm workers, but the findings also held in strong versus weak interventions, uh, whether they were well described, yes or no, we looked at meeting abstracts versus manuscripts, and ecological studies if we removed them. However, the qualities of these studies was not always gr great, so uh, there is room for improvement with those studies. But there was no study that actually found an increase in antimicrobial, uh, uh, reduc uh, antimicrobial resistance after reducing the use of uh, antibiotics. So, why would we do a One Health approach? I think it's very important for a lot of reasons. Surveillance. Uh, many resistant bacteria have multiple hosts and an increased pre prevalence could come from many species. We need the same standards if we look at this in animals for sampling, testing, reporting. And it's important also for the trust of the consumers that we look in, in foods and in animals. Research, there are all kinds of things that we can do together. Many of you work in mouse models. Yeah, those are animals. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, the prescribers are, are humans. So if we target them, we, we can use the same motivational practices for MDs, DVMs, and for farmers. And then the control measures. We need to align the control measures, joint training, um, and then also in infection prevention and control. So what we should not have is a blame game, a non-productive blame game, blame game. Working together motivates both sides and stimulates <coughs> accepting responsibilities, yeah? <laughs> and one, <laughs> I don't respond to humans typically. And <laughs> so, and one point that I want to make, yeah? <laughs> Sorry, uh, we need to really work with the countries like China and India. Uh, uh, that is so important. We need to be an example for them on how, how to work together.